This is Dredgers, a top-down action RPG roguelite style that uh, has been out for a bit over a year now, actually, but it flew under my radar for most of that time, and uh, only until recently have I really saw it, so I decided to go ahead and take a look at it. It's definitely got a pretty big focus on variety. That's sort of its main selling point, you could say, with about 30 different races to choose from, and if you count all of the subclasses and everything, about 40 classes. It's 40 plus is the uh, the quote on the Steam page. So that's a lot of race class combinations. And uh, it's definitely more akin to like a traditional roguelike in terms of its overall influences. The only real roguelite element to it is, well, first of all, the fact that it's real time, obviously, but also it, that would be the fact that it does have a form of meta progression in the form of race tokens. Uh, after you finish a run, after you die, you will gain a certain number of tokens depending on the number of floors that you made it through and the level that your character was at when they died, so you can spend those tokens to unlock more of the races. You start with three, and the other 27 are unlockable, and uh, as is often the case with systems like this and RPGs, the more expensive or more sort of difficult to unlock races are not necessarily objectively stronger, but instead are just a lot weirder and have all sorts of different other strange capabilities that can make them very difficult to play, but really powerful to play if you know what you're doing. Every race has three different skills. Sometimes they're passive, sometimes they're active. Usually they're a mix of the two. It varies by race. And also every class has three skills. And this brings us to the leveling system, the main method of progression and run. And it uses an experience system that's a little bit different from your general experience gauge. You know, instead of just gaining experience by killing enemies, it's a little bit more specific than that. It's split in between blue and green experience. A blue experience is usually the one that you need more of to level up. Up, and you get that just from killing enemies in general. Just every time you kill something, it drops some blue experience. And a uh, higher level or more difficult enemies can drop more than one orb or moat of blue experience. And then green experience, you usually need about half of the amount of that as you do the blue for each level. And uh, green experience is only gained when you kill an enemy for the first time. Repeat kills of the same type of enemy will only give blue, but the first kill of a new enemy will give you both blue and green. This means that uh, levels will come very quickly for the first, you know, couple of floors because everything will be new at that stage for each run, but eventually that means that it encourages you to sort of make a choice between uh, staying in the dungeon branch that you're currently on, the same sort of environment, which means fewer new types of enemies, so you will level up slower as time goes on, but it will also be a little bit easier because you'll be facing things that you know how to face, so you sort of choose a, a gear path in that case instead of a level path, if that makes sense. You'll be fighting similar enemies, so you'll get less experience, but you'll be finding more reliable and easier to obtain gear. Or you can choose to branch off into the newer parts of the dungeon as you keep going deeper, and uh, those will of course have new enemy types, so they'll be more difficult and you'll be facing new things that you have to figure out how to uh, combat effectively, but you'll be getting a lot more of that green experience if you do that, so you'll be leveling up faster. So there's sort of a choice that you make as you continue through the game, whether you want to uh, face new and harder enemies for experience, or continue in the direction that you're going, mostly getting blue experience, but easier gear that way. I've also noticed that blue experience above what you need to level up doesn't persist because you get it very easily, but uh, if you have more green experience than you need to level up, those actually stay in the experience gauge and will carry over to the next level since green is a lot more limited. So that's a nice touch. It allows you to not waste new enemy kills if you don't have enough blue but you already have enough green and then once you have enough of each color you will level up and different races get a different number of points that they can put into their stats per level sometimes not even per level sometimes it's like per two levels it depends on the race that you're playing and uh, each of the stats have quite a few different effects and you can just hover over them to see a nice detailed explanation in the tooltip of what all they do but they all are pretty much what you'd expect in terms of like a sort of tabletop rpg influenced stats you know so you have like constitution and and strength and dexterity and energy and all that stuff but you'll notice you also have some skills, all those previously mentioned race class combination skills. Now you start with all of your race's skills unlocked, because that's the race you're playing, but the class that you choose to start with will only have some of its stuff unlocked, and this is where it gets kind of interesting and where a lot of the variety in the game is. You'll notice that in the bottom right of the screen, below all of these skill symbols, there are those little green pips, and those represent the number of skill points that you can put into that particular category, which means you can't get everything. You can't get or max out every skill in the tree because 
Usually every skill has two or three ranks and there are three of them. So you won't be able to put in enough skill points into each category to unlock and max out all of them. So you have to choose this bit of a mutually exclusive, you know, class choice, which ones you want to focus on, which is pretty cool actually. And then once these uh, pips fill up, you can no longer put points into that category, but a new category will unlock and you can just press a plus that will allow you to select a new class. You can either choose one of the starting classes that you didn't choose before, or you can also choose a subclass because every one of the starting classes has several different subclasses that you can choose from. So you can end up as all sorts of weird builds if you want. You can be like a mage archer or like a sort of magic knight using necromancy or whatever you want. There's pretty much any combination you can think of. You can actually combine all of these different classes and subclasses to create. Now, this was definitely the draw for me because I'm, I don't know why, exactly I think it's growing up with like Final Fantasy tactics and things like that but I'm a sucker for these like branching class systems where you can upgrade the classes that you have to other newer classes and sort of combine them and mesh them in weird ways to create strange builds I guess you know like I said growing up with tactics and Disgaea and stuff like that where those sorts of like evolutionary class systems are common made me really love systems like this so the way that this game works is really open and really fun to use since you can choose any of them at any time. Every time you uh, max out the uh, level ups for a particular class, you can choose anything the next time you level up, either an entirely new one or just a subclass of the ones that you already have. There are some that actually have multiple ranks of subclasses, like the Necromancer, which has three different ranks, each with three skills, so you can become a very powerful Necromancer if you decide to completely focus on that, or you can mix some of it in with other trees if you want to be like a Dread Knight or something, you could do that as well. And there are also some of these subclasses that combine together with classes that you already have, which means you can actually buy more of the previous subclasses skills because they are together in the same category. So points affect all of them, which means you can actually max out more of the previous skills than you normally would have if they were considered like separate classes. But uh, that also means you have to be careful of which ones you actually want to choose because a point in one will affect all of them. So it definitely creates a lot of build variety and there's just a crap load of different combinations that you could create, especially when you consider there are those 30 races, each with their own three skills to combine with them. You get a whole lot of variety and that's, that's definitely the main draw for me because every run feels very different when you're going for an entirely different set of classes. And even if you're doing the same classes multiple times in a row, there are so many different choices that you make along the way, and often the skills are sort of mutually exclusive that you can end up playing a different sort of variant of the same class. If you choose one of the different skills than you did last time and end up branching it and combining it with other stuff that you have to create a bit of a different overall build feel, even though you're the same class as before. So yeah, there's tons of variety with how you can build your character in this game. And that of course brings us to the gear. There are over 250 different items that you can possibly find in the game, including stuff like, you know, your basics, like food. There are also different sets of keys that can open different types of doors and chests. And of course, there are loads of different weapons and armors, each of which can have all sorts of different uh, possible enchantments or curses or other capabilities like being polished to a mirror shine or being mastercrafted or being uh, so sharp that they cause bleeding damage and all sorts of stuff like that. So there's a lot of uh, weapon and armor variety as well, just tons of items in the game, and the fact that there are all sorts of different enchantments, uh, curses, and possible sort of extra crafting modifiers that can be on any of the given pieces of equipment, that definitely helps the build variety, the already very good build variety in the game, be even more colorful. Uh, depending on the race class combination that you are, you can also craft stuff. Some of the classes do not start with the ability to craft, but there's often at least one of their subclasses that will give you that ability if you choose it. Like, the caster classes can't craft initially, but if you choose the artificer uh, subclass, then you gain the ability to craft, and in fact you gain some extra capabilities to use your crafted stuff with, like being able to animate it and have it follow you around and things like that. And there are tons of different materials that you can find to help you actually craft new things. The crafting menu is actually quite large, there's a lot of stuff you can make, and uh, depending on the race class combination that you have, you may be able to craft extra stuff that some other characters can't, or you may have uh, a race that is very, very good at crafting certain things, so they end up at like very high quality with some extra modifiers and stuff like that. And of course, there's also scrolls and uh, potions that you can use that can modify 
your gear as well. One interesting uh, difference that this game uses is in its potion system is that normally in a roguelike or roguelite, potions are unidentified until you either use like a scroll of identify on them to figure out what they are or just drink them to figure out what they are, which can be dangerous. But uh, this game has a second function. You can actually apply potions as well as drink them, which means you basically just like put them on your skin like a weird glowing lotion effectively. And this generally is a way to help you identify potions with less of a risk because whatever it does, it will have less of an effect if you rub it on yourself than if you drink it. So if it's like a healing potion, then it won't heal you as much. But if it's like a potion of poison, then it won't hurt you as much either. So that's kind of an interesting risk reward system. Like if you're really, really hurt and you hope that's a healing potion, maybe you'll just drink it. But if you're in good health and don't want to ruin your run, maybe you'll apply it to something to figure out what it is instead. And there's also some more exotic classes that you can work towards if you wish that do some very odd things. Like as you're seeing in the background right now, I'm playing basically like a sort of summoner with a giant crab army because I mean, I'll always do that if a game lets me. So yes, crab army, please. And lastly, there's of course the exploration aspect. How is that? The game definitely encourages exploration by having this uh, experience system like I mentioned before. And the dungeon exists in several different branches that are sort of like biomes, each with their own themes, their own sets of enemy types, their own tile sets and looks and everything. And there's often a lot of mutually exclusive choice when you actually explore a dungeon because there are often more doors that take keys than there are keys. So you have sort of have to choose which direction you want to go in because you won't be able to unlock every single door door or chest on each level so you'll have to you know make some choices about where you want to go and oftentimes there are also more than one lever in a room however each room only allows one lever to be pulled at a time so if you pull one lever in a room it'll unlock one of the doors but the other lever will seize up and become unusable so you have to make some branching choices about which places you want to go to both in terms of you know how difficult you want to make your run and what you're capable of taking on with your current skill set and also what you're able to explore too based on the levers that you pull and the keys that you use. It also has a pretty pleasant uh, music track playing through each different area of the dungeon that's nicely themed and uh, kind of relaxing in an odd way. You can also pause the game at any time and it actually acts a bit like a real time with pause CRPG in the way that the pausing works because you can just hit space to pause the game, uh, hover over any enemy to you know read their stats and a, a tooltip of their level and all that stuff if you want to decide whether or not you can take them on. And uh, you can also just move while paused or use skills while paused and it will unpause just for the certain amount of time it takes to do whatever you ordered it to do and then pause right back again automatically. So it's a way to sort of add some tactics into combat and exploration allowing you to almost take it like a turn based system where you sort of, you know, go a couple of seconds at a time and then pause again to make more decisions, which is always a fun option to have. There's also the point that this game is mostly made, I'm pretty sure, by one dude, which is always really impressive to me when I see like solo or very small team uh, developers, because I mean, I don't know how to make a game, so it's always impressive to see just a few people or even one person that can make something like this. It's, it's really, really cool. It's also a pretty easy sell because the game is only 12 bucks, and for the amount of variety that it offers, and the amount of possible builds and all the gear and everything, there's a lot to do here. So 12 bucks is more than a fair price, in my opinion, for the amount of stuff on offer here. So I'll link you in the description below this video to check it out on the Steam page. Uh, thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.